panelists yourself, man. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you need me, I'll stay. All right, I'm not, we're all in, right? I'm not blocking it out. Um, no, I'd just like to uh, echo uh, Mark's uh, uh, compliments of the uh, bowl committee and the uh, things that were, were taken care of for us uh, this whole time. And it's really been uh, great uh, coming down here to the accommodations, the practice facilities. Everything's been uh, top rate. And I know the kids are having a great time. And uh, we're looking forward to getting, this, getting to this game. I, I just what the, someone just asked um, Mark about the kids turning pro. Um, what about on your side? I mean, there are some players who are juniors that are um, that are pretty good. Do you can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, or what I, you're I, I I really don't know what the underclassmen their right. plans are. There there are several kids that you know I think uh, you know people have interest in, but. Again, I, I would not uh, sit there and comment as to whether or not they're thinking about uh, going out or leaving or anything like that. I, I have not heard anything like that. So uh, I, I fully uh, expect that all the juniors will be back. And, you know, we do, like every school in America, you know, the, uh, they have the uh, NFL uh, committee that they look at any guy that has significant playing time and they give him a grade and those grades are given to the kids and uh, you know the head coach speaks with them about that uh, information and you know they they and their parents make decisions according to what they need to do but nothing has been relayed to me or to anybody on our staff that I'm aware of that anybody's uh, coming out early or anything like that. Sean, do you generally, I mean, I'm not talking about someone who gets a high first round or a, you know, but generally do you think it's better for kids to come back for their senior year? Do you have some kind of opinion on that? Um, I, well, I would think number one, the kids are, kids are here to get an education uh, because that's going to last longer than anything else. And uh, I think if they're, if they need to come back and get their education, I would suggest that they finish it. Uh, I don't know, in some cases, uh, the kids are so far away from actually having that happen, and, and I'm not saying here at Miami, I'm saying at other institutions I've been at, that maybe their best chance is to go on and if they have a high enough grade and to get an opportunity in the NFL so they'll be able to take care of themselves and their families. So I think they, they need to look at it in a case-by-case -case situation there. Thank you. Is Can L. Golden here, is he involved in any of the game planning? No, sir. Not, not that I know of. He hasn't been involved in any of the, any of the uh, practices or anything like that. He, he, him and his uh, staff have come out. I think what they've done for the most part is they really want to just look at the players, see what they have here, so they can address recruiting needs. Can you talk a little bit about your, your secondary and the success they've had this year and the, the challenge Michael Floyd poses? Yeah. Uh, first of all, Wesley Griff has done a great job. Uh, we call him Prime Dog. Uh, he's, he's, done a, he's done a great job with those kids. Um, you know, they, they really responded to his coaching, and uh, he's been around for four years, so they've kind of grown up with him, and uh, they've, they've played very, very well. And, you know, each week we, when we go in and uh, take a look at the different different opponents, we try to figure out who the guys are that they throw the ball to and their strengths and weaknesses and, and just try to adjust their coverage a little bit to, to help our guys. Um, and crimes are very instrumental with that um, and he's got the kids number one he's got the kids playing hard and fast and things like that and so um, a guy like Floyd is a he's a big player he's a big physical receiver now um, I can remember him I, when I was in Carolina we played Notre Dame and they had him and um, the Golden Tate on the outside um, and um, I know Tate went uh, went out last year but uh, that kid, Floyd, gave us nightmares. I mean, he gave us nightmares because he, he was very physical. They could throw the ball up in the air. And he could just, he had the ability to go up and get it. Um, and that was that was one of his strengths. So we're going to have to know where he is uh, on, the, on the field, whether he's lined up at number one weak or he's lined up at number one strong or if they put him in the slot, et cetera, because they do different things uh, formationally uh, depending on where they uh, where they put it. Are you going to have one guy on him 
specifically no, or no, switch no. out? No, uh, we, we pretty much line up with uh, field and boundary uh, guys and, and we kind of uh, set it up that way is what we do. So uh, we, feel, we feel pretty good uh, that if we need to do something, we'll adjust our coverage to help him. We're not going to try to run a guy all over the field uh, to cover him because the other thing they'll do is they'll take him and put him in a slot. Him, you know, so they can move him around if we match him around. And I don't want to try to uh, bastardize our coverage. Uh, you know, for him, we can we can do things with our coverage, just keeping our, our rules um, squared away. Coach, your reputation is that you get your pass rush through, through your front four. How do you balance what you like to do with facing a young quarterback who you obviously saw in film had great difficulty with a USC defense that did some zone blitzes and gave him a bunch of different looks? Well, I think you have to uh, do, uh, when you look at it, you have to do what you do, and then you, uh, you adjust that to uh, things that, uh, you know, attack, attack their protection is, is what you try to do as far as pressures. Uh, you don't... Uh, you don't just sit there and say, well, we're going to blitz the guy or this or that. Because number one, uh, if you're putting something in, your kids have to learn. And when they're learning, they're not playing fast. When they've got it, then they're playing fast. So what we want to do is do what we do and do it better. Uh, and that's, that's what you practice for. If we have our kids playing fast, uh, our, offense, our defensive line knows which way they're sliding their protection. We can set up pressures the things that we've, we've done to attack their protection. That's what we'll do. Because they, they have, those guys have always have the chalk last. We have to react to what they do. You know, they can give us something different. And all of a sudden, uh, you do something totally different. We will not be comfortable out there. And we don't play well. A lot of times, um, As I told the kids when I first got here, it's not what I call, it's how well you execute what I call. And I think that's um, the key in playing a good fo football team. You have to out-execute. And it, it, whether, you, whether that's tackling, whether that's leveraging the football, whether that's catching the balls that are thrown to you, whatever it is, okay, if you do that well, you're going to be successful. John, can you, can you assess uh, Alan Bailey's play this season? Uh, is it what you had expected? or? I think Rick Petrie's done an unbelievable job developing him. Uh, Alan's been a kid that uh, came here. He played a lot of positions when he came here. He's such a tremendous athlete. And he came here, he was recruited as a linebacker. And he went from linebacker to defensive man. When I first got here, he was playing tackle. And I was really excited about it. I was like, man, he got him in tackle. Holy cow. Uh, a kid with his athletic ability and things like that. So uh, I think he found a home, and uh, he uh, he really took to Rick, and uh, he's really developed as a player this year. And believe it or not, uh, you know we got injuries and things like when Curtis Porter got hurt, that really uh, made us thin inside. And then we had some other guys. Uh, Josh was banged up, so we were limited with numbers for a good part of the year at our D line. And so Allen unselfishly played inside and played outside for us and um, was able to do that very, very well. And uh, I think Alan Bailey is one of the most underrated probably players in the country this year just because he will make somebody squad and he will stay for a very long time because you're not going to find a finer human being, a harder working guy, or a more dedicated person. Uh, in that case, I mean, he totally unselfishly said, "Go for whatever you need. I'll play nose guard. I'll play towel. Do whatever you want." And not a lot of guys would do that with, uh, you know, everything that he has at risk. Can you kind of do the same thing for Brandon Harris? I know he's a junior. But... Well, Brand Brandon's played corner for us. And he plays. He plays our nickel uh, in most positions, and, and that's basically what he's done. He hasn't really changed anything from what he's been doing. Two years, and uh, he just come in and play. Brandon's one of the guys I, I think I said to you all earlier that uh, he's he's got a lot of gifts physically, but uh, you know his dad was a coach, uh, and 
he's he's kind of a gym rat. He's one of the guys that um, if you walk into a, a gym and there's a lot of people playing basketball and you want to have a pickup game, he's one of the first guys you pick. He just has a way to figure out how to be in the right spots at the right time and uh, be able to make plays. And uh, I think he's really developed as a, as a player. Now he hasn't been as productive. You know, uh, I've coached some Thorpe Award finalists. Uh, Ty Hill was a guy I coached at uh, uh, Clemson, and Ty might have had a little bit better stats as far as maybe some things going. But Brandon doesn't necessarily have all the stats that you want because people don't throw him the ball because he's he's taking care of uh, his business, and uh, that's a compliment to him. So there's quiet guys that you don't read about, especially in the back end. <coughs> They're really doing a good job. I mean, you don't hear much about 13, but 13's done a pretty good job for us this year, silently. So. Coach, could you talk about uh, Notre Dame's running game the last three games? Uh, it seems like that's really helped their well, training record. Well, yeah, they, uh, you know, they, they do a lot formationally to try to uh, um, help themselves. They, uh, they'll, they'll spread you out, and uh, then what they do is they uh, try to pick uh, dictate your coverage by being spread out and then they'll move some people around and try to get you out manned in the, in the running game. They do a very nice job of that scheme wise and um, they've uh, they've been able to pop some runs on everybody. You know, they're they're running the ball as good now as they were before now. I, I guess uh, is it Armando? He's I don't think he's playing. Is that, is that right? No. Um, but even without him, you know, so it's not necessarily the player. It, it, uh, it has a lot to do with how they're how they're doing things. Obviously, the better player doing it, uh, bigger plays will happen. But uh, they, you know, Coach Kelly's done a nice job scheme wise with with what they're doing uh, to give you some, give you some problems. A few years ago, Notre Dame went through a similar situation that you guys have with your coaching staff, and it didn't turn out very well. What what gives you reason to think that your cohesion's still there and that that the players are responding to what you guys are are bringing? With um, well, listen, I'm not a prophet. Uh, I can just uh, I can just sit there and, and look at our practices and, and how hard kids play and, and the level of competition that's going on out there and the chatter that's going on between them. So uh, it hasn't been any different this week or last week than it has been, uh, than it was earlier in the year and when we were playing for everything. So I think they're excited to play the game. I think they'll go out and play pretty hard. Um, you know, the, the one thing you don't really know is in the end, if we start off fast or we start off slow, how that how they'll be affected by that. But I, I think we have a pretty good core of players that um, will hold this thing together. That's what I'm that's what I believe in. Coach, question? Hi. Coach Kelly has uh, been pretty honest about the fact that Reese is going to let him manage the game and not put the game in his hands. As a defensive play caller, does that give you anything to take advantage of from that standpoint? Um, not really. Just uh, you know, that's that's smart for any coach to do that because if you put it on one player, uh, if you take that player out of the game, you, you've taken away the other ten players. Uh, so he uses all eleven players on offense, and uh, I think that'll make him a better, more effective player, uh, the quarterback, than you know. He is with, without without putting the pressure on his shoulders and saying to do it. I mean, he is indirectly putting the pressure on the kid because he's starting playing him. Um, but uh, he's just asking him to carry out his role. And uh, it, unlike uh, you know, I don't think Coach Whipple is telling you, Corey, that the game's in your hands. You know, we've got, we've got a lot of a lot of people uh, on offense to spread the ball around to. And I, I think that Coach Kelly is basically saying. Hey, we're just going to run our offense. You just operate. He's been very successful doing that over the last few, uh, the last few games. I mean, he hasn't he hasn't really played poorly. Um, they've they've been doing pretty well. And they're moving the ball pretty well. They're, they've got some pretty good stats. Um, John, you were talking about you know Coach McGriff, and I think the pass defense is I think number two in the nation. Total defense I think is 16. Um, so obviously you guys have done a good job, and I, some of you aren't coming back. Obviously, can you talk about the commitment that you you've made to you know to follow through with all this, and that you're all together, and just basically how frustrating it is knowing that you've done a good job and you're not coming back. 
Well, that's, uh, that's just part of the business. Um, you're, you're in this business, it's a people business, and it's uh, driven by a lot of different people. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, the guys in the room, the players on the field. There's, there's other things that go on, TV, uh, revenue, uh, just fans, whoever. They just, people make decisions on, on how things are going to be and they, they just go on with it. So when you make a change, for whatever reason you make a change, whether it's not enough, I mean, bottom line, we didn't win enough games uh, to keep people happy right here. So um, the statistical part of it really doesn't make that much difference. We could be 116th in the country, we could be one in the country, okay? If we don't win enough games, keep the right people happy, then, you know, change is made for whatever reason. Has okay. it been kind of emotional for you guys and the team and the players? Well, I think I think for the players, you know, you may, you make bonds with kids, okay? It's always, that, that part is always tough, but, uh, and, you know, you get you get friendly with coaches and you're used to being around them and things like that, so that's always difficult, but, uh, you know, you understand coming in, uh, you know, I remember reading a book by George Allen, uh, Merry Christmas, you're fired. Uh, one of his famous lines, and uh, you have you understand that when you get into this business, it's a rough business. It's uh, it's a people business. Uh, you all out there when you write, um, you know you, you you sit there and say we've got to do this, this, and this. Well, we do have to do this, this, and this in order to keep our jobs. But you know, if I if I did this, this, and this, uh, I may be walking in here and saying, I'll see. You. Because I may be going someplace else. Because somebody, you know, wants to do, wants to do something else for me that the University of Miami doesn't want to do. So that's you know that's all part of the business. We've all been there. You know, head coaches come and go. Head coaches get hired and fired. And when they do, they bring their staffs or you know people they're comfortable with um, in. So that's kind of what's happened here. And you know, I know I know Al Golden very well. I've got no animosity towards him at all, and uh, I don't have any ill feelings towards uh, the university. I mean, I, you know, I, um, I understood coming in here what this, what this place was, what the expectations were, and uh, didn't, didn't think that uh, you know, anything short of this would happen with, uh, with, with what happened this year at the end of the year. But um, I don't know that uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. I, I don't want to get into everything else about it. About it. So we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. So it's a tough business. Uh, we all know it's tough, but it's tough on your face. It's toughest on your families. And, uh, you know, we just, just move forward as we go. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.